My name is Colin Sanders and this is the History Books Review. Basically I read books about history and review them. Sometimes this is the kind of review that you might read in a newspaper or magazine which is basically to give you an idea about whether it's the kind of book you want to read. Other times it's a review in the sense of an assessment of the contents of the book to find out what's in it. For the last eight years I've been doing an extended chapter-by-chapter -chapter review of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I've got halfway through it so far, it's a rather long book, and I've just dealt with the end of the Empire in the West. From now on we'll be covering the Byzantine rather than the Roman Empire. This is going to be rather different uh, uh, because the Roman Empire is sort of mainstream. The Byzantine Empire is a lot better known than it used to be, but it's still something of a specialist taste. As such, I can imagine that there are people who might want to get on board the train at this point, now that we are heading off into rather less familiar territory. I will aim to avoid making too many references back to early material, so you can treat this as, in effect, the start of a new series. Welcome on board. The Empire in the West was over. Italy was now a barbarian kingdom run by Odoica, an Ostrogothic Gothic chieftain. But we'll get back to him. First, let's look at the early career of a young, upwardly mobile barbarian called Theodoric. He had been born into the royal family of the Ostrogoths shortly after the death of Attila. The Ostrogoths had been vassals of the Huns and had joined him in his attempt to overthrow the Western Empire. When he had been unexpectedly driven back and then unexpectedly died, the Ostrogoths took their chance and grabbed their independence. They were located in Pannonia at this stage, nominally still a Roman province but actually beyond any actual imperial authority. It is very roughly the area south of the Danube, just downstream from Vienna. The Ostrogoths had solved their political problems by breaking away from the Huns, but they still had their economic problems. They were, in fact, on the point of starvation. So they set off south towards Constantinople with the intention of converting their military skills and ferocity into hard cash. The path was a well-worn one. The barbarians made sure that they caused enough trouble to make sure that the Empire saw the wisdom of hiring them. As part of the deal, Theodoric, as a child of the royal family, was handed over to be held hostage in the imperial household. This gave him the benefit of a civilised education he certainly learnt a lot about the way Roman society worked, which he was to put to good use in his later career. This didn't, however, extend to actually learning to write. But literacy was no longer a key skill in the Roman army, and as he grew older, his abilities as a commander were recognised, and he became the Magister Militum, the effective commander of the American Roman forces and was even appointed as a consul. At the age of 31 he returned to his tribe to take up its leadership. This was quite likely to have been an elected role so he wouldn't have had a shoe in. He needed to merit the role so he was now both an official of the Roman Empire and a traditional tribal leader. Just how this worked is a bit hard to determine and my guess is that it was probably a bit ambiguous at the time. What we can say for sure is that the job of keeping Theodoric and his Ostrogoths loyal to the authority of the Empire was not an easy one. For example, he was ordered to deal with a rebellion by another group of Ostrogoths, led by another Theodoric. He carried out the order in his own way, and ended up in charge of both groups. And thus was now even more powerful. The Byzantine Emperor was no doubt right to feel uncomfortable. The Empire had faced the same situation some hundred years before, and faced with a powerful Gothic leader in the form of Alaric, the two halves of the Empire had done their best to get him into the other half. There was no longer an Emperor in the West, of course. Italy was being run as an effectively independent state by the German tribal leader Odoacer, and he could easily become more ambitious still. But the same logic applied. By directing Theodoric against Odoacer, the two threats would be neutralised. Ideally, they would fight each other to a stalemate and leave the Byzantines alone. Theodoric was invited to invade Italy and to rule it until the Emperor came. That actually isn't too far off the actual text of the deal between the two men. It's hard to say whether the idea 
was that Theodoric was to simply hold on to Italy on behalf of the Emperor, or if it was to be his. I imagine that nobody at the time was sure either. In the event, Theodoric triumphed relatively quickly over Odoica. He had the support of the local population, at least at first, as Odoica was not at all popular. Getting the backing of the Senate needed a bit more work, but they came round when the campaign was clearly swinging in his direction, and support for Theodoric began to coincide with self-interest. He was able to trap Odoica in Ravenna. He finally finished him off by a simple ruse. He agreed to a peace deal, but then simply murdered him, personally, at a feast held to celebrate the agreement. This is hardly the most noble of starting points for a reign, but these were savage times, and Theodoric was a long way from being the worst ruler Italy could have ended up with. His policy was one that we would describe as apartheid. The Goths were assigned a third of the Senate's lands. This was a continuation of Odoica's policy, and indeed was a memory of the late Empire's policy of billeting allied barbarian troops. There were some 200,000 Goths following Theodoric, so this was some imposition. Two legal systems were run, one for the Goths and one for the Romans, and needless to say the Goths had the more privileged one. But the Romans did at least still have the rule of law to protect them to some extent, and so by the standards of the time it wasn't too bad a deal. Compared to the rapacious extractions of the Huns and the Vandals, Theodoric was a pretty good option. He also used his military resources for the benefit of the inhabitants in Italy as well, by putting a stop to raids by the Vandals. While it's important never to forget that Theodoric was an illiterate barbarian who owed his position to an aptitude for violence, his court was a surprisingly civilised one, utilising the talents of Roman administrators. One of these in particular shines very brightly on the pages of history. His name was Boethius, and he was in many ways the last serious figure of the Western Roman tradition. He was descended from a Roman family of influence who had in the past produced emperors. He entered public service at an early age and held a number of posts, culminating in Magister Officorium, which can probably be translated as boss of the offices. He was a sort of fixer, able to conjure up the kind of thing that only cultured and well-connected people can. He sorted out a water clock as a present to Gundapad, the king of the Burgundians. He arranged the services of a top-notch lute player to impress Clovis, the Frankish king, and as a Greek speaker, he could handle diplomacy with the Byzantine Empire. It was probably some faux pas connected to the relationship with Constantinople that led to his untimely death. He was accused of plotting against Theodoric in an obviously trumped-up charge, but given that the two men worked closely with each other, who knows what the real reasons for their estrangement were. But while Boethius had the brilliance, Theodoric had the power, and the Roman ended up in prison under sentence of death. He spent quite a while on death row, which might well mean that Theodoric had half a mind to spare him. This was a good thing for the later reputation of Boethius, because it gave him the time to write what was to become his great legacy, the Consolations of Philosophy. This was a hugely popular and influential work in the Middle Ages. King Alfred of England even did an English translation. Its main contribution to human thought is to explain how free will can be reconciled with an all-powerful god. Later civilization can thank Theodoric for giving his minister a rest from day-to-day -day business and time to work on something of more long-term value. Of course, Boethius did end up either decapitated or garroted, sources vary, so it sort of swings and roundabouts from his point of view. Let's hope he was able to be philosophical about it. Ravenna was to be Theodoric's capital for the next 33 years. As Odoica had demonstrated, Italy was quite capable of being run completely independently of the Emperor's wishes, and Theodoric had a free hand to do exactly as he chose, but he chose not to openly flaunt his independence, and his reign continued to nominally respect the authority of Constantinople. But nominal is the word. Respecting Roman law for his non-Gothic subjects avoided one source of conflict, but was no doubt a sensible policy anyway. He certainly pursued his own foreign policy. He was opposed to the Vandal Kingdom in Africa, and forged alliances with other barbarian kingdoms against it. The aim appeared to be to establish himself as a de facto ruler in the West, to try and fill the power vacuum left by the fall of the Empire. His successes in this arena were only modest, but he was playing on a tough pitch. But while there is no doubt that Theodoric was, like all politicians, motivated largely by self-interest, he very much played the ideal role from the point of view of the Byzantine Empire. He provided a very useful buffer against further barbarian aggression from the West, particularly from the Vandals. At the same time, he wasn't strong enough to create a state big and powerful enough to threaten Byzantium, Byzantium himself. It is worth also pondering just how much damage 
such a strong piece of Theodosius on the chessboard could have been if he'd been deployed further to the east. As such, the biggest effect of his long reign was to create the preconditions to enable some able ruler to realise the potential power of the Byzantine Empire. We'll be back in the east next time to have a look at the start of the career of one of the most charismatic of the Byzantine emperors, and one who was able to get the Byzantine Empire back into the top league. I hope you can join me for that. While you're waiting, why not take the opportunity to leave a comment on the iTunes uh, comment feed on YouTube or on the blog. And in the meantime, thanks for listening. Thank you.